Now that's significant. The Market Research Podcast. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on the latest episode of Now That's Significant, a market research podcast. Uh, This is your host, I'm Charlotte Hearn, I'm the Business Development Lead at InfoTools and I'm based here in the UK. So today we're joined by Jane Frost, the CBE CEO at the Market Research Society, also known as the MRS. So Jane, I'm going to do a little bit of bigging up because that's what I can do as the host, Um, it's my thing. So Jane has over 30 years of experience um, in board level marketing and strategy positions in major blue chip companies and public bodies. Impressively, Jane holds uh, holds over 150 awards for advertising, branding and design, as well as being executive producer of a a double platinum record. She's currently leading radical change at MRS to enable it to improve its profile and expand membership. Okay, that's my picking up bit done, Jane. Um, So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, no, it's great to get to chat to you. So I think I'll just jump straight in. So, Jane, what's the most significant thing you're going to talk to us about today? What do you think we're going to sort of home in on today? Well, I, I'd like to talk uh, uh, about the Code of Conduct and the, its importance in ensuring that the UK market research sector is one of the most respected and largest worldwide. And that may sound like a very odd link, but I think it is really important that how we do our research is a major influence on how much people pay us for our research. Well, exactly. Totally agree. So I'm looking really looking forward to talking about this, actually. So why do you hold such a strong view um, regarding the the MRS, MRS Code of Conduct? Well, I think the MRS Code of Conduct is a guarantee for clients of the quality that they're going to get. Mm. And a huge number of clients obviously aren't very experienced in research. But it's a bit like uh, that that sort of warm feeling you got when you knew you you never got fired for uh, buying IBM computers. You know, if you're using somebody with a market research accreditation and that means they're signed up to the Code of Conduct, then you know that they have a code that they're going to follow. And particularly in the area of professional services. It's not like ball bearings when you can sort of measure them and weigh them and things like that. You can't do that with research. So you have to take a lot of on trust and the code is a sort of guarantor of trust. Yeah, it's really important to have that kind of relationship with the people. I mean, they're spending a lot of money, right, on research. So they need to have that trust with us. So absolutely agree on that. Um, So can you give us an overview of the MRS Code of Conduct and what it generally covers? Yes, it's it's very comprehensive and it gets updated about every couple of years, so it never goes out of uh, relevance. And it's been going for almost 70 years, so we must be doing something right with it, or rather the people signed up to it are definitely doing something right, because there's never been any suggestion from government that they uh, should want to regulate officially, uh, and that saves us a whole amount of money. It's detailed code, but it has some core principles. And the core principles are to do with transparency, honesty, uh, very importantly, that it shouldn't be used to influence the people that it's researching. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you can imagine why that's important. Confidentiality and above all, respect. And we do also ask people to ensure that they're exercising independence in professional judgment. Because don't forget, we're asking a lot of people about their opinions And we may be asking it by people who have very strong opinions themselves, particularly in polling. So that independence of professional judgment is important. And probably as an umbrella to all of that, that nothing is done by any research company that will adversely impact the the reputation of research. So it's a professional code. Uh, It's summarised in those key bullet points. And then there are quite a few details underneath (laughs) I'm sure there is. You just sort of mentioned, actually, it's been going for 70 years. So it'd be really cool to get a a little bit of a history lesson from you, sort of how what what was the journey of this code of conduct? Well, the code of conduct uh, starts, obviously, because a uh, we're a profession. We're not a profession regulated by uh, mandatory codes like the accountants uh, and the lawyers and everything else. So this is an important uh, foundation stone of us being a profession Uh, and way 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 back in the mists of time there were some very important and and still very highly regarded researchers who decided that a code of conduct was going to be uh, 
critical to the reputation of what they wanted to see themselves as. I think when the MRS started, there were um, five people gathered together and thought there might be 25 people in the in in the UK who were capable of doing this job. Uh, and of course, we now cover hundreds of thousands of people and a worldwide reach. Uh, and I think the key to all of this is, is relevance. If you're not relevant, then people pretty soon sort of, uh, nowadays, I hope they don't print things off because of saving trees, but they pretty soon stick something in a waste paper bin or in a filing cabinet and don't actually bother, they just tick a box. So it's got to be more than box ticking. Uh, we have something called Codeline, which helps the, our accredited companies with interpretation, and that's always busy. Uh, and you can imagine during a, um, times like COVID, we were updating mm. our guidance to researchers sort of every few weeks because the government was changing its mind. And essentially, what you can get with a code of conduct like ours is all those laws and there are hundreds of them, or certainly dozens, that impact our sector, are brought together in one statement of things that are relevant and, and useful. So you don't have to have a, a legal uh, advisor on hand. You just need to be a professional who understands the code. Definitely. Well, it's clearly working because 70 years is uh, go going strong. So that's that's great. So... You mentioned it about, but how how much of an impact has technology played in shaping the code of conduct as it stands? And how might you think the code needs to adapt moving forward? Because obviously, as you're saying, the whole staying relevant, obviously things changing all the time. So, yeah, what, what, did we, what do you kind of think needs to adapt moving forward now? Well, as I said, one of the key principles is transparency. Hmm. The code is technologically neutral, so it applies to not the method you use, although there will be specifics for, say, face to face, mm. uh, but actually how you conduct yourselves in the in applying a methodology. Now, clearly, AI is the thing that everyone is talking about at the moment. Oh, buzz, uh, and buzz word. <laughs> I know. And I'm not alone because I've talked to people in in the BBC and, and other broadcasters who think that a lot of this is hot air, but it's hot air that everyone's talking about. It is, yeah. It really is, however, I think an opportunity as a technology for us to do things better. But the key thing that worries most people is the sort of black box that is AI. It's a really lacks transparency in the way it goes about doing things. So what we are really interested in developing, and we have just uh, working on submissions to the government uh, consultation on regulation of AI is that key factor of transparency. How do people know how the results that are being churned out come into being? Uh, and unless you know the how, or you have the opportunity to ask the how, I don't know that you can be, um, you can trust your results. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I've just actually been at a conference, really, and AI is the thing that everyone's talking about, and we can't really avoid it. So we we kind of have to go with it, don't we? Like that, as you're saying, the relevant things, we kind of have to go with it. But yeah, no, totally agree. So well, I, I think guess, if I may, well, there, there, there's a buzzword thing, isn't there? Particularly yeah. in marketing. Uh, and and a few years ago, it was big data. Big data. Yeah. Yeah. And, and metaverse was thought, next or something. Yeah. yeah. And then. And now, now it's AI. <laughs> and these buzzwords, the problem with these buzzwords is they confuse and people uh, and they obfuscate. And if you dig down, you really have to work out what you're doing uh, using that label, I think. Other than, yeah. what, other than generating a lot of money because you put a label onto things. So true. Yeah, we talk about it freely, but not actually many people under, really understand it, what, what it actually is we're talking about. It's just the, bu the buzzword, as we say, isn't it? So it'd be really cool just to find out a bit about what are the kind of ultimate aims for the MRS co co Code of Conduct? Where, like, where do you want to get to? What's the aims? Well, we would like, obviously, anyone doing research in, in the UK to be applying the Code of Conduct <laughs> because there are... You know, you have a code of conduct probably for two or three reasons. One is commercial. If you do good research, you should get paid well for it or better for it. The second is obviously ethical. Yeah. Doing certain things is wrong. And unfortunately, you have to uh, sometimes you have to regulate to, to stop people doing uh, the wrong sort of thing. Uh, and the third is about protecting your supply chain if I, I if I can use a commercial term that doesn't sound like research but 
in effect, our suppliers, our ultimate suppliers are people and their data and the things that have happened to them, their lived experience. Mm. So in order to get that, keep on getting the amazing insights that we do uh, as researchers, we need to ensure that they are confident in giving us their data. And again, the, the, the code of research is ultimately that guarantor for the public as well as for the person who commissions it. So what would I like? I would like everybody conducting research to be doing it consistently with the code of conduct. It's a big ambition, but not yeah. that big because most of the market research companies in this country are signed up. So that's great. But we'd also like to see more clients signed up because yeah. the principle of they're the ultimate power if they commission high quality, then that quality trickles down again through the supply chain. Definitely. No, that's absolutely true. Um, so can you share some of the changes that you've made to the MRS code to support transparency and accountability? Well, the two key ones that came in recently, one is very much at the heart of what I um is a passion for me, I suppose, which is to move forward on the equality and diversity agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, a lot of market research is done on the basis of sampling. Obviously, you know this, I'm not going to teach my, my grandmother to <laughs> suck eggs, but how transparent is the sample on which that is based? Mm. We do know that people can claim that they've got a a nationally representative or a city representative uh, sample. And actually, in the worst cases, that can be based on a sample of one weighted up. Mm. So one of the things that we ask uh, for is improved transparency on how those samples are uh, generated. So if you're going to claim to be nationally representative, we should be able to see how what that claim is based on. And that, that element of transparency I believe will improve uh, practice. And I'd very much love, again, it's about clients, when they see a proposal that says nationally representative, making sure they ask, tell us how. Yeah. And when it's reported on that that transparency exists uh, in, in the report. And that is, I think, the signal about most important thing that we've done in the last 18 months in terms of the code of conduct. But there are other things like, you know, we reflect the current issues of the day, like non-disclosure agreements. Uh, and we've heard all about how NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, can impact people's liberty to speak out, to whistleblow and that sort of thing. Uh, and one of the re new requirements is that any NDAs that are enter in, entered into shouldn't compromise uh, the use of the, uh, the, the, the practice according to the codes of conduct. So that's the um, key element that reflects current concerns that we are reflecting with the latest iteration. Yeah, it feels like we have a long way to go, but it's good that we're talking about it now. I do a lot of the uh, women in research events. I went to one recently, a couple of weeks ago, and it's just good that we're hearing people talking about it more and more. So actually, that's really stands out for me quite a lot. So the next thing is, are you aware of any benchmarks regarding the effectiveness of teams who adhere to the code versus those that don't, whether that's from an employee turnover perspective, market research spend, customer outcomes? I imagine it'd be really great if we could um, add value for the industry surveys like the GRIT reports, for, for instance. Yes, uh, it, it's a very good question. And uh, having grown up trained in Unilever, I know that my the founder of my company always said that uh, he could tell uh, that 50% of his his advertising was effective. He could he just couldn't tell you which 50%. Um, uh, and I think there is an issue to do with market research that we can actually generate an ROI on research. And there are numerous reports around from the MRS's own Delphi group, which is our think tank, uh, but also from the GRBN, the Global Research Business Network, uh, who've looked at effectiveness. So there are 
overarching effectiveness studies, we don't get as far as how, working out, because it's very, very complex, whether uh, somebody who is an accredited company partner is more effective than somebody who isn't. I think that would be almost impossible, frankly. Mm. But what we can do is for deep dive elements, like um, the work we do on representation in research, is do research to prove that if you do research in a more representative way, you actually discover commercial opportunities that you might well have missed otherwise. So there are elements that you of, of uh, our guidance which you can prove work, but it would be very hard to prove that the, the whole thing does. What I can tell you is that uh, increasing numbers of clients are using it as proof of quality, so they demand it in their procurement processes. Uh, and what I can also, t I, I can't prove a negative, but I can I can probably guarantee that if we didn't have one, the government would be here doing it for us, and we probably wouldn't like the expense associated with that. I'd imagine not. <laughs> and what are the, and what are some of the consequences brands might face if they don't adhere to these practices that are literally spelled out within the code? Well, uh, anyone has a right to bring a complaint. Yeah. Uh, and we have very, very um, thorough complaints procedures. We will obviously try to resolve everything firsthand in a uh, non-confrontational uh, consent basis. But uh, a complaint can be taken all the way through to our standards board and, and adjudication on that. Uh, and uh, there are various elements of discipline, uh, which include being drummed out of the brownies, essentially. Uh, we can withdraw membership. Uh, and yeah. that is, I can assure you, taken very seriously by our members because it does have a direct commercial impact. Yeah, you need the other members to feel safe in the space they're in as well. So that absolutely makes sense. So I think we've covered quite a lot already. Um, I want to finish like, like coming towards the end of it on a, a high note. What would you say some of the benefits brands should expect if they live and breathe this code of conduct? Well, I think that lots of, well, your decisions, your big decisions taken on the basis of evidence generated by market research need to be assured. So if you're a CMO mm. and you're going to try and get money from your CFO, you need to be able to, to, to assure them and that the evidence base is secure. And the core to that evidence base being secure is how the research is carried out. And the core to that is, is it carried out in terms of the principles of the code of conduct? Um, I do think that there is a, a lot of evidence of other places where you've got very complex codes, where if people drift away from the code, mm -hmm. you do get problems. Uh, and one of the things I always remind people of is, is essentially the army, which has nine million laws, like we've got sort of so many laws uh, uh, according to us, but actually operates for, by a fairly simple code so that everyone can remember it. Yeah. So. The principle we operate with our codes is they should be easy to apply, and I think they are, and with supplements, and I'm going to get a pitch in here for our pledges, our pledge for inclusion and our pledge for net zero, is that you can actually repeat them because they are very, very clear and very easy to remember. So it's also very easy to see if you're doing it or not doing it. Definitely. So is there any, th any final words before we sort of close the session that we you don't think we've covered or something, you know, sort of a closing thing you'd like to sort of get out before uh, we close the session? Well, I think I'd like to remind people that as a sector in the UK, we're worth about um, £8 billion and a huge amount of that is export. Mm. So we are one of the UK success stories. About a third of that revenue is export. So we should be proud of what we do. Mm. And doing professional research is part of being proud of what we do. I always get a slightly sort of um, annoyed that the you can talk about architecture, we're much bigger than architecture as a profession, but it gets a lot of coverage. And very funnily, read your newspapers or watch the TV, but certainly your newspapers, 20% of that uh, content will have some form of market, social or economic research involved in it. So be proud of what you do and operate like you're proud of what you do. 
definitely. It's a funny little industry market research, actually, isn't it? It's a big industry. Sure, it's a big, industry. It's, no, it's a, a big, sorry, a big, funny, big industry that we work in. Of course, a lot of my friends ask me about what I do, and I sort of say market research. They say, oh, you know, is that what you always wanted to do? And I say, oh yeah, when I was nine years old, I sort of said I'm going to be in market research. Of course, I wanted to be a Disney princess. But um, now I'm in it. Yeah, you realise how big it is and how much there is to it, and it's actually quite enjoyable telling people and sort of educating them what it is and what we do. So. Definitely, um, yeah, and there's a lot, lot more to come with AI and all sorts of things happening. So it is, a, I think, an exciting industry, in my opinion, uh, bias slightly. <laughs> well, I think the other thing that uh, is, is interesting to remember is we are part of the social history of the UK, and probably mm. much more than in any other country. So actually, you can trace research back to how do you get people to conform to rationing in, in, in the war, but also how do you get people to put seatbelts on? And we have a major archive, which is now being used by schools and universities, which actually reflects the fact that the social history of the UK is written in the history of research. It's yeah, important. It definitely is. So I think that's all from me. If there's anything else you want to add? No, no we're good. So I'll, I'll close up then. So a big thank you so much, Jane, for um, joining us on this episode of Now That's Significant. Um, for the listeners out there, we'd really appreciate if you subscribe to the podcast, share with others or leave a review. And I guess for me, thanks for listening to Now That's Significant.